Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for our very first virtual veterinary talk. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Liz Somerville and I'm the practice manager at Lock Even Equine Practice. Um, for those of you that do know us and the practice, you'll know that we love putting on these, uh, we love putting on client talks and, you know, we'll usually have a full programme of events planned throughout the year. So we were initially quite sad when um, COVID hit and our lockdown happened and we had to cancel all of our planned talks um, and workshops. But not to be kept down for long, we figured that if you guys can't come to the talks, we would come straight into your living rooms and talk with you there. So um, we've had a couple of practice runs, but please bear with us if we have any technology hitches. Um, as, as we said, this is our first one that we've done before, so <laughs> we will see how it all goes. Um, before I introduce everybody to Jenny, who is our speaker for this evening, um, you should all be able to see um, a chat box down the bottom um, and we also have a Q&A panel as well. Now the Q&A um, panel, if you have any questions that you would like to um, ask Jenny at the end of it all, then if you pop your questions in the Q&A panel, it will just make it easier for me to track those questions so they don't necessarily get lost in the, in the chat box. Um, but if you just want to make any general comments, um, you can obviously pop that, pop that in the chat. And if you, um, you'll see down the bottom of the chat box, you can select whether you send your messages to all panellists and attendees, um, or you can specifically select people that are there. But if you want everybody to see your comment, make sure that you've got the all panellists and attendees ticked as well. Okay. Um, so yeah, so Jenny's going to do her talk and then we'll have some time at the end for hopefully lots of questions and um, there's also we're going to be running a couple of polls as well for you um just throughout the evening so if you can contribute to those that would be really useful just to find out a little bit more about who we've got um who we've got online listening so um i think with the boring housekeeping stuff out of the way i am delighted to welcome jenny prof to speak to us about laminitis mm -hmm. Um, Jenny's been working in equine practice for the last 15 years. She has her RCBS certificate in equine practice and she's also an RCBS advanced practitioner. She's passionate about equine medicine, dentistry and anaesthesia and in her spare time she's travelled all over the world with the horsepower team lecturing and providing CPD to other equine vets. So Jenny, over to you. Thank you very much indeed and uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, it's looking like the, the technology is working fantastically which Liz has, uh, has spent a lot of time setting up so um, yeah, we will uh, we'll continue. I'm looking to speak for probably around in about 45 minutes. Um, I have said to Liz as well if you have pressing questions throughout the talk I'm happy for Liz to interrupt me at any point in time if you have a question that's prudent to the part of the talk that I'm, I'm discussing at the time or we can wait until the end for for questions as well we'll just see how uh, see how we get on so we'll uh, this is what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, we're going to just start off with the general anatomy of the horse's foot. Then we're going to look at, at causes and triggers that can predispose your horse to laminitis. We'll then discuss the clinical signs that you can look for. We'll discuss the diagnosis that generally is done by the veterinary surgeons. We'll look at the treatment that we would offer horses that are suffering. And then we'll look at prevention and moving forwards with your horses uh, after they've hopefully recovered from the bout of laminitis. So this is a really nice schematic diagram of uh, a normal horse's foot here. Now I hope you can see my mouse moving as well. There's just a few um, points here I'd like you to take note of. Um, number one here is just the distance between what we call the dorsal hoof wall, so the hoof wall at the front of the foot here, and the pedal bone or, or P3, the coffin bone um, here. Also we've got the um, distance here, number two here, which is our founder distance, which is a distance from the coronary band, so where the, the horse's skin turns into the keratinized hard hoof wall here, and the top of the pedal bone here, which is called the extensor process. This distance is very important. Looking at other anatomical structures as well, we're looking at the deep digital flexor tendon here, onto the palmer or the back aspect of the pedal bone here um, which will become more relevant um, later on in the talk. 
Here we've got another schematic diagram, just looking a little bit more closely at a sort of more of a microscopic level of the foot here, trying to explain exactly what the laminae in the horse's feet are. So you can see the internal aspects of the horse's foot here. So on the pedal bone here, we can see these finger-like projections here coming off the pedal bone and inserting onto the inner aspect of the hoof wall here. These are your laminae and you can see they're incredibly intricate in design and they are absolutely vital for the functionality of the horse to maintain the pedal bone in exactly the right position within the foot and ultimately the horse's soundness and the ability to, to continue to thrive and to live. Looking at what can predispose your horse to getting laminitis, so these risk factors here and also the trigger factors which can directly cause your horse to get laminitis here. One of the big things that you're going to hear me talk talk about tonight is, is the weight of your horse. Um, I'm going to repeat myself a lot and you will probably be quite fed up with that by the end of the talk but this is one thing that is really really vitally important here. As you can see there are other risk factors here looking at foot balance. We've got our two major metabolic diseases here so PPID, pituitary pars intermediate dysfunction which I'll, I'll generally just call PPID because it's much easier. You may also have heard of equine Cushing's disease, um, which is the sort of more old fashioned name of the disease and equine metabolic syndrome. Now these are, are very important. So we'll be discussing these later on in the talk. Any horse that's had a bout of laminitis will predispose them to getting laminitis again. Um, it's always an increased risk. We can't always explain why, even if you've got a healthy, happy horse, but any changes within the foot from a previous bout of laminitis will ultimately put your horse at a higher risk of getting it again. And also looking at um, and veterinary aspects of potential laminitis. We will always talk to owners if we have to give horses any form of steroid treatment, particularly long-term treatment, as this can be what's called an iatrogenic predisposition for your horse getting laminitis, which basically means we are giving your horse a medication or a product that can predispose them to laminitis there. Um, other triggers which can have a direct cause of laminitis at the time. Um, looking at your grass, the sugars in the grass is here. Um, increase of fructans in the grass. Um, if the horse goes out and engorges in the fields or possibly um, escapes into the lovely lush uh, silage field next door, that can uh, be a direct cause of laminitis. We also have conditions such as grain overload if your horse escapes into the feed room and, and has a good um, a good feed on the carbohydrates that we don't want them to have in excess. We can have a big problem there. Also looking at um, illnesses, particularly septicemia, endotoxemia, these can be a direct cause of laminitis. Um, concussion, if your horse is worked too hard on, on our hard roads or possibly in our very dry fields, which of course we do have at the moment with the lovely weather we've been having on lockdown. And also looking at supporting limb laminitis. So if your horse has got a condition in one foot, that makes it non-weight bearing, so potentially something like a septic pedal bone, a nasty abscess, possibly even a fracture, and the horse takes excessive weight load onto the opposite limb or in, indeed hind limb, then we can also have um, a one-footed laminitis there of the supporting limb, which is, is very nasty indeed. So looking um, at an overview of, of PPID, equine Cushing's disease, this condition is it's a failure of negative feedback from the brain to the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland releases a lot of hormones which then control other organs in the body. And what we do is with this negative or the failure of negative feedback, we get an excessive production of the hormone, particularly ACTH, adrenocorticotrophic hormone, which then directly affects the adrenal gland to produce different hormones. There's many actions that are caused by this excessive production of hormones, but one of them is a direct effect causing the decreased uptake of glucose moving into the lamellae cells in the horse's foot. This leads to activation of enzymes in the foot called MMPs, matrix metalloproteinase enzymes. A bit complicated, you don't need to know the name there. These enzymes then have a direct effect on the extracellular proteins around these laminae, which in essence results in the cells not functioning properly and dying, leading to separation of the laminae, which then means that the pedal bone within the hoof wall capsule is unsupported. So thinking back to those finger-like projections that I showed you at the start, all of a sudden those attachments have separated. That pedal bone in the foot is then free to move with the effects of gravity and the, the body weight 
pushing down onto that bone, which then leads to the changes that we can see on radiographs. Looking at the clinical signs that you can see with PPID, um, as you can see from this list here, we've got early clinical signs and more advanced, or more signs in the more advanced cases, the more chronic cases. But what you will see is that there are some clinical signs that you will see in the early and the advanced cases of PPID. And unfortunately, a lot of the time when it comes to us, laminitis is the first clinical sign that is noted by the owners when it comes to your horse having PPID. Of course, by that stage, unfortunately, it's a little bit too late um, in the process for us to, um, to prevent the laminitis if that is the first clinical sign that we see. Sometimes owners are aware of the condition and will notice things like the horse not shedding its hair coat. We also see signs of what's called hypertrichosis, which is your classic appearance with Cushing-eyed horses where they have a longer curly coat than you would expect them to have, particularly one that they don't shed after winter and they end up having this hairy coat throughout the year. So our hair shedding there. Um, also, we can see this symptom of, of bulging of the fat around the eyes. What's um, the supraorbital fat fossa, or the fossa that you can see above the eyes? Um, it sits just above the eyes, and normally it's a, a concavity that you can see in your horse there. But when they have Cushing's disease, you tend to get excessive fat deposits in these fossa, which then results in, in a doming of the fossa filled with fat rather than the concavity that you would normally see there. That can, uh, that can actually be very marked in some of the more advanced cases there. But again, looking at the similarities between even the early disease or the more chronic stages of PPID, you can see that laminitis is, uh, is a common factor between, uh, between all cases of them. This is just a picture that I, I pulled up from the internet showing the sort of classically known phenotype of a horse with PPID. And I think a lot of us will, will instantly look at this and realize that this pony does have PPID. And of course, this is a more marked case that we have got here but what we need everyone to think about is looking at the more signs in the early stages of the disease rather than waiting until we end up with a pony that looks like this. In general it's very easy for us to diagnose PPID um, we come out to see your horse we will take a blood sample into what's called an EDTA tube it's just a particular type of blood tube that we can use that's got an anticoagulant in it. We take that sample straight back to the practice on ice normally or at least chilled in our fridges and we use a centrifuge to, se to separate this sample and we, we're looking at separating the, the plasma off from the red blood cells because we just want this plasma to send off to the laboratory. If we can do we send it on the same day we send it on ice if we can't then we've already missed the post then we will freeze the sample and we can send it the very next day but it's very very important for the results to be accurate that the sample is sent on ice so of course timing is actually very important here. Very occasionally we'll get results back in, in a sort of gray area. If the results are sort of equivocal, they may be sitting on the borderline of yes, your horse has got PPID or no, it doesn't. Sometimes we will recommend a further test called a TRH stimulation test. We don't do this terribly often, but if we're still concerned that your horse has got PPID based on the clinical signs it's showing us, it may be that we have to do further tests after this basic test. Equine metabolic syndrome, um, I'm sure a lot of you will have heard about this because it's, uh, it's certainly a very hot topic in the equine world because of course we know more about it as time goes on. It's generally characterized by obesity. That's generally one of the main signs that we're looking for. A horse that is possibly out of work or, or really lacking in fitness and specific fat deposits that you can see. So for instance, in the crest of your neck, the fat pads that sit over the gluteal muscles. So over the top of the hips, you can see fat pads that sit there or at the back of the shoulder or excessive adipose tissue covering the ribs um, all these different areas that you can look for to notice that your horse is carrying too much fat there. When you have got this excessive amount of fat laid down, the body tries to respond to this because it doesn't want to keep laying down fat. It's got enough already there. So what it does is the body then reduces its sensitivity to insulin. Insulin directly builds up fat deposits. It's a storage hormone, an anabolic hormone. So the body stops responding to this. Then what the body does as well is that the pancreas, the organ where insulin is produced, the pancreas becomes hyperactive and produces more insulin because it wants the body to be sensitive to the hormone that it's producing. And the resultant effect of this is a, is a big increase in the insulin levels in the blood. That term is called hyperinsulinemia. 
And we know through the scientific tests that have been undertaken that this is a direct cause for the onset of laminitis. And it's very, very important to remember that. That's the main mechanism of how equine metabolic syndrome works and causes the laminitis. Identifying this metabolic syndrome or what we also term insulin dysregulation. A lot of the time we could actually argue, do we actually need to diagnose it? If you look at the photographs that we see here, it would be very clear to a veterinary surgeon that this horse is significantly obese and overweight. And as you can see here, the statistics say that a huge number of our population of horses in the UK are indeed overweight. We can look at this horse and suggest that this horse is actively suffering from equine metabolic syndrome, but it is also important that we do the clinical testing to actually get a laboratory analysis and diagnosis of metabolic syndrome so we know where to move forward and to measure the improvement over time. There are limitations to the testing and there are multiple tests that are available, just similar to the PPID. And we have to be aware of the limitations and they're not all foolproof and definitive. There's a lot of clients out there that don't in fact want us to test for EMS because people don't want to have this this diagnosis of basically us saying that the horse is overweight. A lot of clients don't like to accept that. But unfortunately, in a situation when your horse is suffering from laminitis, we do have to be very, very honest about your horse's body condition score and the ailments that it may be suffering from that are directly causing the laminitis. So it is very, very important from our point of view to make sure you are aware that the horses are suffering from these conditions so that we then know what to do about it. The caro syrup test is the way that we would look at our first line of diagnostics looking at equine metabolic syndrome. What we do with this test is that we ask you to only feed your horse hay overnight. We used to ask that horses are starved, but the more recent recommendations with this test is that feeding hay is, is perfectly acceptable, but we cannot feed them any concentrate feed. We then give them 45 mils per 100 kilograms of body weight into a dosing syringe, which you can then put it directly into your horse's mouth. It's this syrup here. It's a, a corn syrup containing glucose, and it's, uh, it's superseded the old school glucose challenge that we used to do, trying to get horses to eat significant quantities of glucose, which was actually very challenging. Once you've given your horse this caro syrup, the vet will come out around about an hour after you've given the syrup. And generally what we'll do is we'll take two blood samples around about 15 minutes apart. And what we do is we then analyze those samples and we are looking at the glucose levels. We'll make sure that the glucose levels are elevated to show that the horse has received the sufficient quantity of syrup that we, that we need it to. And then we will look at the insulin response to that corn syrup that we've given the horse. So we look at the overall insulin levels and you can see here, if we have a diagnosis of around about 45 and below, we will suggest that it's unlikely that your horse has got equine metabolic syndrome. If the result is greater than 60 international units per liter of insulin, then we will say that your horse definitely has got equine metabolic syndrome. But you will also notice that there's a gap between 45 and 60, which again is a little bit of a gray area, similar to the PPID testing where we, we don't know for absolutely certain if the horse is suffering or not. And it may be that we have to include other laboratory tests that we do. Um, for example, looking at triglyceride levels, um, hormone could other tests that we can add into this caro syrup test as well to help us with the diagnosis. So going back to the horse's foot and what happens here. Once we've got inflammation and death of these lamellae cells, we get the separation of the laminae. This is where gravity takes over. The, the horse's weight pushes down, down the limb, and you'll have to excuse me here because I'm not trying to be rude, but a horse walks on the equivalent of our, of our middle finger, and I'm, no, I'm not being rude, so apologies there. But if you imagine them walking on that middle digit, you can imagine the force that is pushed down onto that pedal bone in the foot there. So gravity takes over and that pedal bone not being supported is free to then move in the foot. And this is where it's relevant thinking about the anatomy of the foot and you can think about the pull of that deep digital flexor tendon on the palmar aspect, the back aspect of that bone there. So moving back to our schematic diagram, you can see the normal foot here and then you can look at a horse's foot affected by laminitis. You can see that the distance here between the dorsal hoof wall and P3 here, the pedal bone, you can see that we've got an increased 
movement of the bone here away from the dorsal hoof wall. You can also see here this foot is, is a little neglected because frequently we see horses with laminitis that have got elongated toes here, which never helps us at all. We can have an increased measurement here, the founder distance, number two here. We can see stretching of the white line on the bottom of the foot. So if you pick up the horse's foot here and look at the white line, you can see the stretching there. And quite commonly, you can also see changes associated with, with hemorrhage, bleeding into the lamina there, which you can see at the stretch white line. And we can also imagine the pull of this tendon, now that the pedal bone is free to move, the pull back here then results in the rotation that we can see when we look at radiographs of horses' feet suffering from laminitis. This is a radiograph of an active case of laminitis. We can tell it's active because we can see this gas shadow here, which is the white line, or at least where the laminae sit, which should be tightly adhered. And because we've got separation there, we've got literally a gas shadow where there is now a space where the pedal bone should be held in place and it's not. And we can see here that we've got rotation of this pedal bone because, oops, my apologies. Looking at the contours of the dorsal hoof wall here, we should have a parallel line between the dorsal hoof wall and the pedal bone here. And you can see very clearly that we've not, we've got rotation as well. So already we know that we've got pathological changes in this foot, which means the prognosis of this horse recovering is already less. It's not, it's not nothing, it's not grave. We would still expect this horse to recover looking at the x-rays alone, but we know that this horse is already in difficulty and we need to act on these changes that we can see on the radiographs there. Going back to what I was just saying, you can look at the bottom of the foot here. Here's your elongated stretch white line. And quite commonly, that's where you can see the bleeding. And sometimes you can even get serum leaking out from the dead laminae here. And also you can see where dirt gets pushed up here because we don't have a tight attachment anymore. We've got air filled spaces here and dirt gets pushed up here that can cause discomfort and it can also lead to abscesses as well. Abscesses in laminitic feet are very very common which also then just contribute to the problem that we have we're trying to treat them and stabilize them. So what do we see? What are we looking for you to see in horses that potentially are suffering from laminitis? All the clinical signs relate to pain. Laminitis. Sorry can I just interrupt? Do you want me to pop the poles up? I'm yes, if you can do that, yes. So I'll just launch these polls, guys, and whilst you're listening to Jenny, um, if you could answer them, that would be super. So let's launch the first one. So if whilst Jenny's chatting, you can get that answered, and then I'll launch. Right, I'll keep chatting away. Perfect. Yep. No, that's uh, that's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. So all the clinical signs that we will see in your horse is suffering from laminitis are related to pain. Laminitis is a serious welfare issue and we need to make sure that we resolve these clinical signs of pain as soon as possible. You will notice these as, as possibly a generalized stiffness. Sometimes it even looks like your horse may have tied up. It doesn't want to necessarily move forwards or it's reluctant to move. You may see specific lameness, possibly more in one than the other, or you may notice lameness as the horse is moving across uneven ground, such as stones and such. In the more severe cases, you can see horses that are, are rocking backwards, so trying to take their weight on their back legs rather than their front feet, because classically, laminitis is a condition of front feet. You absolutely can get it in all four feet, and actually, if you do have laminitis in all four feet, we know that you've got a very serious problem there with your horse. It's, um, it's much easier to treat laminitis when it's only in two feet as opposed to four feet. So if you do see your horse rocking backwards, chances are its hind feet currently at the time are not suffering too much, and the horse is trying to take the weight off the forelimbs and place them onto the back feet. You may see a horse shifting weight from one foot to the other. It sort of sways side to side, lifting up at a foot at a time to try and take pressure off that foot because of course standing on it with weight pushing down on the foot causes discomfort. Digital pulses is always, finding your digital pulses is always a symptom of laminitis. I have never known a horse actively suffering from laminitis that doesn't have palpable digital pulses. You may find it difficult to find them if you have a heavily feathered cob or a horse that suffers a lot from dermatitis. With thickened skin, it may be difficult to find these digital pulses, but hopefully you will be able to feel them. And certainly I would expect that they would be very prominent on horses actively suffering. 
Horses don't like turning when they've got laminitis. When you try and turn, you put increased pressure on these already separated laminae and you're actually causing the pedal bone to move within the hoof, hoof capsule. So that leads to pain. So you will generally see that if you try and turn the horse in a circle, it's very, very reluctant to move. We can also get pain on, on hoof testers. So that's one thing that we would do as your veterinary surgeons when we come and see these horses is put the hoof testers on and generally you will get a reaction unless you've got a horse with a severely um, or, or a very, very hard foot, very, very dry, hard foot, then you would certainly see the pain response when we put these hoof testers on. And uh, also in severe cases as well, you can feel at the coronary band you may feel a depression, which is already indicating that that pedal bone has moved, and you may find that that's uncomfortable for the horse there. Right, I'm going to see if I can have a look at these polls, but at the moment, I can actually only see... Can you see the first one? Um, no, I, I can only see number two, Liz, that's, okay. um, so I can't see... The one's voting at the moment on poll number two, but I'll quickly just let you know what the results were. So 26% of people said their previous horse had had laminitis, Mm -hmm. uh, 26 percent okay. their current horse has had it in the past um eight percent said that their horse currently has laminitis an active bout and 30 percent said that their horse has never had it and three percent said that they weren't sure okay okay well that's that that's good and it's also um i like the honesty of people saying they're not sure because it's not always easy to tell we have this classic list of the clinical signs here in the more severe cases, but they don't always show up um, with every clinical sign. And sometimes they can be very mild as well. If you've got an early case of laminitis, it's still important to know that the horse is actively suffering from the condition, but it may not be um, completely obvious to know um, how it's getting on. Um, I'm just looking at the results of the second poll here. I think we've got most people... Um, have voted. Um, this is actually really pleasing for me to see. Um, I don't know actually if the the um, people watching this talk can actually see this, but 72% of you has said that you would actively call your vet if you thought your horse was suffering from laminitis. And I must admit that makes me very, very happy because we genuinely consider laminitis as an emergency. It, it really very much is. And we would always come and see horses if you felt that your horse was suffering from laminitis. So that, that does please me a lot. Um, calling the farrier, um, I can appreciate why people would consider that. It, it is a foot condition. Um, sometimes people know in a sense that we will remove shoes and such. Um, and farriers can at least help us. But generally, if you have a horse that's suffering from laminitis and your farrier sees it first, Farriers will generally turn, advise that you take your horse to, um, or you call your vet and have them assessed by the veterinary surgeons. Um, just looking at the other options, some people know that they would um, need some box rest, but uh, box rest where you can turn out. That's um, that's a little bit concerning, and we'll come to we'll come to that slightly later on. Um, but no, very um, very interesting results um, from the polls there. Thank you very much for that. Some people may find it very difficult to find the digital pulse, and I wanted to put this image up just to help you. If you have a horse that has a leg like this, you will find it easy, and I know that this is, is not really a classic leg. We have a lot of heavier weight horses and feathered horses and such, and also this, of course, is, is a clipped leg as well. You can actually see... Sorry to interrupt you just quickly. That was one of the questions that's probably a really good time for you to answer. Somebody has mm -hmm. posted a question and, and asked exactly that um you know for some advice and finding the digital pulses in the native ponies and horses with the thick okay lots of hair and feathers so if you could cover that as well that would be <laughs> um the honest answer is you've already got a challenge on your hands um it's unlikely with laminitis that we would recommend you clip feather off your horse's leg and i'm not going to upset people by suggesting that but it is easier if the feather is clipped off because you have one less barrier in trying to feel this pulse. <laughs> Veins, arteries and nerves run together. It's called a neurovascular bundle and it's classic all over the body. So what you can see here in this leg, in this image on the left here, you can actually see the neurovascular bundle. What you're probably seeing is the palmar digital vein running down here. And of course we don't feel a pulse in a vein. But with that vein runs the artery and the nerve. <laughs> Both the vein and the artery you can occlude. If you put a pressure onto an artery or a vein, you can completely occlude it and stop it from thumping so you don't feel a pulse. But what you can never do is you can never occlude a nerve. The nerve is always going to sit there and a nerve is a very, very firm structure. So what you want to do 
is you want to go to, to the palmar aspect, so the back aspect of, of the fetlock, or indeed the pastern. I must admit, I always aim for the, the, the fetlock here because I find it significantly easier than, than finding the pulse in the pastern. And what you want to do is you want to use the inside or the outside of the leg, it doesn't matter, it's exactly the same, whichever you feel more comfortable with, and use, use your three fingers here. Remember that your thumb has got a pulse in it, so don't use your thumb. Use two or three fingers to try and find this pulse. And what you want to do is you want to run your fingers sideways over that palmar aspect on the inside of the outside of the horse's leg. And you want to put a reasonable amount of pressure on it because what you will find is that when you hit the nerve, the nerve will flick underneath your fingers. So you should feel a little popping sensation against your fingers once you're in the right place. And that means that you can feel the nerve. Once you can feel your nerve, you know that you're in the right place for this neurovascular bundle, which means if you then locate your fingers directly over the nerve, but release the pressure a little bit, you will allow the artery to continue pulsing and you should be able to feel the pulse at that point in time. I do genuinely appreciate that this leg is, is a little bit of an anomaly in a sense that you are lucky if you have this. And with your native ponies, I absolutely sympathize. It is very difficult. And to be completely honest, it's difficult for us as your veterinary surgeon as well. We are very practiced at it, but it can still, even for us, be difficult. And it can also be difficult if you've had horses that have had severe mud fever and pattern dermatitis and some of these cobs that have had skin conditions that have been neglected possibly prior to you owning them and have significantly thickened rolls of skin on the back of their legs there and um, it can be almost impossible if not actually impossible to feel this structure so it's worth having a try and feeling even if your horse is not suffering from laminitis a normal horse will either have no palpable pulse so you either can't feel the pulse or it's very very mild and that could be completely normal for your horse and it's very very helpful to know what is normal so that you can then establish what is abnormal when you think your horse may be suffering from laminitis. So have a practice at it, feel for the nerve, feel for that flicking underneath your fingers, and then see if you can feel the pulse there. What are the treatment aims when it comes to laminitis? Well, as a general rule, we want to try and maintain your animal's welfare, your horse's welfare. And by doing this, we need to control the pain and inflammation and take that pain away as quickly and effectively as we possibly can. Once we've done that, we need to prevent any further damage happening within that horse's foot. So we need to stop that pedal bone from moving and dropping and rotating any more than it may already have done. Because the more that pedal bone moves, the lower the prognosis for that horse recovering. We also need to look and treat any underlying primary condition that may have caused this laminitis. Now that may be an emergency situation if we have a horse suffering from septicemia or endotoxemia, so possibly um, a post-falling endometritis or a gastrointestinal condition that may have caused this, it's vitally important that we treat that primary condition. That may also be one of our metabolic conditions, PPID or equine metabolic syndrome, and it may take a little while for us to actually investigate and diagnose them, but these have got to be our primary aims when dealing with these horses with laminitis. Thinking of the longer term considerations that we will also look at is the corrective farrier that we can advise our farriers to do on these horses to help maintain their feet in as best condition as we possibly can. And also consider any other options that we can offer your horses, thinking about surgery. Um, surgery, however, tends to be more of a salvage procedure to help keep the horse alive and not necessarily allow it to move back to being a fully active horse that can be ridden and such it does tend to be a salvage procedure just to keep them alive but it is something that we can consider as well looking at the different medications that we can choose here to help your horse will depend on its situation with regards to underlying diseases but certainly thinking about managing the laminitis we move to drugs called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs which most of you will know as as the phenylbutazone drug so danalon shanazone bute um, or equipalazone which is the sort of classic butes that we have and these are certainly the the three non-steroidal drugs that we supply here at lock even equine practice we also have other drugs that you you've probably heard of metacam through through dogs with osteoarthritis this drug is prescribed commonly in small animal practice and we also have another drug called finidine that we can use as well Generally, the first line um, that the vets will choose will be one of the phenylbutazone products that we have here as our first off, but we can move to the metacam or the finidines if we feel that the horse is not responding well enough to the phenylbutazone. 
if your horse is relatively refractory and not responding as well to the, the non-steroidal medication as we feel that we want it to, to make it comfortable, we may add in standard paracetamol um, into the mix, 20 milligrams per kilogram twice a day can be added on top of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, drug dose to help with the refractory cases to try and help keep them comfortable. We also consider using drugs such as, as ACE Promazine, um, ACP. You may have heard of this drug, uh, Acetylene Reliquin, which you have for, for mildly sedating horses. Um, these drugs, they do have a vasodilatory effect. And what that means is they dilate the blood vessels in the foot. They can help with the, the circulation within the foot. But they can also have a very sedative effect on the horse, which can help horses that are not happy being contained on box rest which they will be. So that can help relax them. We do not want stressed horses with laminitis because stress causes a release of, of cortisol. Cortisol is a hormone as well, has adverse effects on horses suffering from laminitis. So that's something we really need to prevent as well. If your horse is diagnosed with PPID, we will strongly recommend the use of a drug called Prasend, um, which is pergolide, which comes in a tablet form, which is a very, very good drug at, at controlling your horse's PPID. If your horse is diagnosed with EMS, we may consider using medication for that horse if it is not able to actively exercise, which of course, if it is actively suffering from laminitis, then it won't be able to. Um, standard drugs that we would choose would be, would be metformin, which is a, a human medication, which really is helping to try and, and resensitize the body to the insulin, so ultimately we can reduce the insulin levels. It has also been known to help prevent absorption of, of sugars and such from the gastrointestinal tract. Um, relatively limited bioavailability, which means it's not absorbed terribly well from the horse's intestinal tract once it's given orally, but it's certainly better than, than, than not doing anything at all. So it's a drug that we consider using. There's also another drug that we can consider called, called levothyroxine, which is a synthetic thyroid medicine that we can use, an oral drug. Um, we really don't use this very, very commonly at all. We would be only considering using this for the, the terribly obese horses that are not responding terribly well or quickly enough to dieting and management that we're choosing for them. Um, but it is a drug that is, is, is available and has relatively recently become more available to us. So it's something that we will probably consider using more of in the future just to help promote weight loss and remove the risk with the equine metabolic syndrome. Jenny, um, just, sorry, just before you move on, there's been, um, we've had quite a few questions coming in, um, but we'll keep most of them to the end. But there is one specifically which was just asked um, about uh, what about DMSO as a medication? DMSO, um, not used terribly commonly. It is a form of an anti inflammatory that you can use. Um, if we had an incredibly severe hospitalized case, then we may consider using it. It's really not used terribly commonly at all. Um, if we had a hospitalized case, you would tend to give it um, only in at the hospital. You wouldn't give it out to, to owners to give. Um, you quite commonly give it um, as an venous infusion. Um, yes, in, in very, very select cases, you may use DMSO, but really it's not something that's used terribly commonly. Um, you can get DMSO in some topical products, but they wouldn't be recommended or licensed for use with laminitis um, for an internal condition. They, they can get used for um, splints, um, inflammatory conditions, but not, not with laminitis. So potentially but really not very commonly at all i certainly can't think for the last time i used it um it's been it's been years since um since i used dmso on a laminitic case um so yeah an, an option but not used terribly commonly super thank you very much um radiographs are they necessary um Yes, is the, is the really easy answer there. Um, we would always offer and advise that radiographs are taken of any horse that's got active laminitis. It does help us confirm the diagnosis if that is indeed needed. Sometimes in the more mild cases of laminitis, it can be a little bit questionable if, if that is indeed what the horse is suffering from. But not only that does it help us confirm it, we can then look at the measurements that I've already explained to you on the schematic diagrams and use them to help us assess the horse's prognosis and that's the prognosis for survival and giving you indications of whether that horse can be returned to its normal work you know possibly a competition life can it be returned to to grazing to pasture 
or indeed is the prognosis so poor that we may have to consider the very difficult decision of, of considering euthanasia in these cases if the prognosis is very, very poor. Um, having the measurements that you can take on the radiographs also allow us to go and work with your farriers and we can show the radiographs to your farriers which can then allow them to do the appropriate trimming and shoeing as per the measurements that we can, uh, we can show them on the x-rays. You can look at these images here and you can see that we've got this, this is a horse, I don't, I don't know the actual case itself, but this horse is obviously undergoing treatment. We normally actually tend not to x-ray um, with shoes on, but in this case, I can tell with the shoe that the horse has got here and the shape of the foot that this horse is already undergoing farriery for its laminitis. And I suspect it's probably doing very well. The gas shadow at the front here has gone. We have got some minor changes on the pedal bone indicating that this horse has likely had a, a number of episodes of laminitis. We've got this beautiful shoe on here and a very, very nicely balanced foot. Whereas conversely, if you look at the foot here, you can see the, the significant distortion in the shape of this horse's foot here. And, and dare I say, possibly a little bit neglected with regards to routine farrier and such. But you can also see the changes in, in the dimensions of the pedal bone here significantly compared to the normal pedal bone here. And this, I suspect, probably pony has suffered significantly with laminitis over the years that has led to these changes here. And I suspect that this pony probably is, is chronically lame. And certainly, even if it's not actively suffering from laminitis, it will be showing significant signs of discomfort. And I suspect this would be, would be a euthanasia case just by looking at these radiographs. Management, what is it that we are going to suggest to you? Box dress. Absolutely, immediately put all these horses that have got laminitis onto box rest. We need to stop them from moving because every step that horse takes adds more pressure onto that pedal bone that's free to move in the foot and then can cause further movement there. We will alter your horse's feeding and recommend that they have soak hay and we take them off grass. We will also recommend a diet that's suitable for them depending on their weight and their body condition score at the time of examination. Your veterinary surgeon will advise on the best diet possible. 2% dry matter as per body weight is a sort of standard maintenance diet. 1.5% dry matter intake would be uh, a sort of light diet to try and get weight off these horses. And a 1% diet is, is very, very strict. We don't tend to use 1% diets terribly often, I must admit, um, because they can come with other, other problems as well um, using that lower diet. Um, we'll recommend changes to your horse's bedding and uh, recommend they're, that they're bedded on sand, which I know certainly in the UK we don't use this terribly commonly, but sand is a wonderful product to put on your stable floors to help support horses' feet that are suffering from laminitis. Um, what we tend to recommend is shavings, um, particularly deep littered, because they can compact very, very nicely and give very, very good support. But we will probably also use our own foot supports and, and normally what we call a putty pad that we mould to the shape of the horse's foot and we put that on on the palmer or the back aspect of the foot and what we're trying to do is take weight off the front where we've got pain from the movement of the pedal bone causing bruising onto the toe of the sole we will then recommend more rest this bit is very very important an absolute minimum time scale of a horse suffering from laminitis needs to be at least 28 days on box rest but generally is going to be significantly longer my little flashing note at the bottom here if you can put into place all these management changes and the medication that your veterinary surgeons prescribe to the horse, you can hopefully turn these clinical signs of laminitis around very, very quickly. And that's our aim. We are aiming to take the pain away so that the horse then looks normal and comfortable. Because if we can make them comfortable, we then have time to resolve the laminitis. Just by making your horse comfortable with medication does not mean that the laminitis is gone. And the mistake that a lot of clients and owners make is that they look at their horse comfortable in the box. They think that it's over the laminitis within you know, three or four days and they turn it back out again. And that sadly is not the case. It takes an absolute bare minimum of 28 days for these laminae to reform, regrow and reattach and support that pedal bone within the hoof capsule. If you turn your horse out before that 28 days as an absolute minimum, you can then cause that horse just to go back to square one and possibly even worse, back to its laminitis and having that pedal bone moving in the foot. So you have to be very, very careful not to turn these horses out too soon when they're actively suffering because you can really do significant harm by doing so. This is just an example of the foot support that we can use here. You can see that we've got the padding at the back aspect of the foot here. So we've got, got more padding here. 
running down to very, very little padding here and leaving the toe clear so the horse is preferably not weight bearing on the toe there. And then we wrap it up using various bandages there just to support the, um, the materials in place there. Feeding, certainly in the acute stages, um, we'll recommend a high fiber diet, um, preferably hay rather than haylage. We will recommend that that hay is soaked. The quantity of hay will be given as, as a weight in kilograms that your veterinary surgeon will advise as per the weight and, and body condition of the horse. We will ask you to soak that hay for at least three hours. Some people will also recommend double soaking. So soaking for three hours, draining it, and then soaking it again. But the, 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 at least three hours is the absolute bare minimum you want to be soaking that hay for. And what we're aiming to do is we're aiming to leach out all of the soluble carbohydrates within that hay that may lead to a spike in insulin after the horse has eaten the hay. You can also have um, branded products for laminitics. An example here that, that Karen, um, my colleague Karen, has given me is to use the high fiber um, horse age, which, which looking into it is, is a very, very good product that you can give lamina laminitics with less than 10% um, structural carbohydrates. And it is also approved here, as you can see, for horses that are suffering with laminitis. But it is also important to remember that hay is better for weight loss than haylage is. So if your horse will eat soaked hay and you've got access to hay, that's what we will recommend. But there are other products out there as well. We can use an alfalfa-based chaff to feed your pony or horse that will help you get the medication into it that we've, pre that we've prescribed. Um, two examples here. Happy Hoof is a, is a really nice one. Spillard Happy Hoof is a product that I um, particularly like, um, but we have no uh, affiliation with Spillers to, to specifically recommend that one. It's just one that I, I do like to work with. Um, probiotics may be recommended if your horse has got any gastrointestinal upsets. That's important. And if your horse is going to be on longer term box rest than 28 days, a multivitamin and mineral supplement is, is very sensible because by soaking your hay, you're not only leaching out these soluble carbohydrates, you also leach out all of the vitamins and minerals um, that is in the hay there. So we do need to supplement that. We will recommend feeding little and often and in the horse prevent boredom and it will also help maintain gastrointestinal health because we have to think of other conditions such as equine gastric ulcer syndrome um, when feeding horses on box rest as well. And we follow the weight recommendations given by your vet. Of course, we want to look at and see a horse that looks sort of healthy like this in a body condition score of two, two and a half when suffering from laminitis. You want to just be able to see the ribs lying there, but no more. What we don't want is to be diagnosing your horse's body condition score four or five and seeing the, you know, the big cressy necks and the fat deposits and such. We absolutely do not want to see horses that look like this. Sadly, the showing ring does make us have to keep horses like this or, or have to, I guess, by choice um, for the competitions and such. But this is, this is really unacceptable. This pony is at significant risk of getting laminitis and that laminitis is posing a significant risk to its life. So we, we really cannot afford to keep our, our horses and ponies in conditions like this. Why do these ponies get fat? Well, there certainly is um, evolution that has re led these ponies, particularly our native horses and ponies, to this insulin resistance and this building up of these certain fat pads and this insulin dysregulation. But what we also know is that we are very, very prone to overfeeding our horses. Um, and I really like this little uh, phrase here, chronic excessive calorific intake which just simply means your horse is eating too much for the workload that it's doing, if indeed it's doing any workload. Um, we don't tend to have problems with, with thin horses with laminitis as a, as a general um, anyhow. Prognosis for the condition will depend on the clinical signs. Um, we have got a grading system that we can use to grade how severe the clinical signs are. Um, we also need to look at the response to treatment. We need to get that horse pain-free. And if the horse doesn't respond to the medications and the management changes, then the prognosis is very, very poor indeed. Um, we look at the radiographic changes and we can look at certain measurements that we know will alter the prognosis and the chance of that horse surviving this laminitis. And depending on how much or of foundering we've got, the sinking distance, which was the distance, the, the number two on the schematic diagrams, um, more than 14 millimeters, we've got a, a much poorer prognosis of survival. And also when we start getting rotation of the pedal bone, we know that that is also um, a poor prognosis as well. If we get a prolapse of the pedal bone through the sole of the foot, we, we know that 
that is an emergency situation and that warrants immediate um, euthanasia, putting to sleep. Um, if we see this, this that, that, that's a nasty situation. Thankfully, we don't tend to see that terribly often. We've normally made decisions before that point, but that's a, a grave prognosis when you see that. Other considerations to think about, um, welfare. Welfare, welfare, welfare is the absolute utmost importance here. You have to go think about the, the age of the horse, what it's got to live for, what it's doing, how well it's going to settle to the time on box rest. Is it going to, to cope with this time, which, which could be a month, it could be six months. Sometimes it's even longer than that. Will the temperament of the horse allow for that to happen? These long periods, is it possible that we can, can even do this? Can the owner cope with these changes? Um, I know a lot of people who are listening have had horses on box rest. Some of you do incredibly well. You may work from home. You've got, you've got other horses that can keep your horse's company. Other horses um, are kept in situations where they maybe don't have stables. They're away from home. Owners cannot be with them you know, throughout the day. Um, it takes a lot of time, effort, um, heartbreak, blood, sweat, and tears. It really does. Um, Unfortunately, it does come with significant costs as well, and we have to consider ongoing farry costs and indeed veterinary costs as well. Um, sadly, unfortunately, sometimes we do have situations where decisions have to be made on costs, and that's fine. That You shouldn't feel guilty about that. That's just the reality of life, and that's just what we have to make you aware of um, moving forward from here. Um, looking at the poll results here, um, thank you all for voting. Um, you know, five people that are watching this have lost horses um, and ponies to laminitis, which is is so dreadfully sad. It's it, it's, it's absolutely devastating. And, and I know certain people that are listening to this that have done absolutely everything that that we have asked them to do. Every bit of management change, every medication they can, every re-examination, multiple radiographs, and sometimes we still don't, do not win these cases. Laminitis is such a horrible disease and it's so serious. And ultimately, we sometimes have to consider, sadly, that euthanasia is actually the better option for these horses rather than persisting. And it really is heartbreaking, but it's important to know that laminitis, it is, it is a killer. It absolutely is a killer of a disease, and we, we have to remember that. I'm going to try and rattle through the, the remainder of the slides here because I know I've, I've been talking for a while here, but um, it's important to work with our farriers so that we can recommend different ways of, of trimming versus shoeing and we can seek their uh, opinions and their advice um, from their vast experience of doing this in the past, various different types of shoes that we can do and ways we can trim the foot to really help. We absolutely want to keep the length of this toe short. Having a very, very long toe puts increased pressure when the horse moves up the dorsal hoof wall here, which can increase the separation of the pedal bone from the dorsal hoof wall. So we definitely, definitely want to keep these toes as short as we can, uh, we can manage there. And we want to try and trim the horse's foot to the alignment of the pedal bone. We can never put that pedal bone back to where it was. But what we can try and do is we can try and improve the alignment of the hoof around the pedal bone and the foot there and then we can put on these supportive structures and shoes that help support the foot so we don't have any further movement of the pedal bone. Preventing it, listen to your vet and what they advise with regards to feeding. We really really need to keep these horses weight down and what we want to do is we want to prevent that metabolic syndrome. We need to work with the farriers, we need to really keep the trimming regular, we must keep those toes short. Even in horses that are recovered from the laminitis it makes a very very big difference. We want to maintain gastrointestinal health and we want to exercise these horses when possible if the previous bouts of laminitis allow them to carry on exercising. Exercise is very, very good at completely reversing equine metabolic syndrome and that's very, very important if at all possible. And it is vitally important, if I can just stress again, to consider these underlying metabolic diseases, the equine metabolic syndrome and the PPID, if you think your horse is suffering from them, even before it has got laminitis, if you can let us know so that we can come out and assess your horse, possibly do some of the diagnostic tests and diagnose your horse with that so we can then treat these conditions before they get laminitis, that potentially could save your horse's life. Make sure you're not feeding your horse too much. Don't feed them excessive quantities of cereals. Maintain the high fiber diet. Try not to feed them rich lush grass if you've got starvation paddocks um paddocks that you can strip graze possibly turn horses out at night when there's less sugars in the grass these are all things that you can do to try and minimize how much grass the horse is is, is actually eating don't manage grazing by time horses realize very quickly that if you're only going to turn them out for just an hour that they get used to that and they will eat significant quantities of grass in that hour you're better off managing your grazing rather than managing it by time 
maintain the ideal body condition score, please. Um, so we're not letting these horses get obese. As I stated before, make sure you're exercising them, even if you've got, um, for instance, a miniature Shetland. I stupidly bought my son a miniature Shetland. Why I did that, I don't know. They're generally laminitis waiting to happen, but I'm working very, very hard to keep him exercised. So I take him out, I long rein him, and I lunge him to try and keep his weight down because I am I'm paranoid about this condition because we see it all too often and, and we have to deal with the, the nasty cases. So if you can keep these, these horses and ponies exercised, it, it makes such a significant difference there. Um, don't forget that it used to just be springtime we would see all this lush grass growing but it's not the case anymore we can have such variable weather we can see it at the moment with this beautiful weather on lockdown um, but we can also see that you know significant grass growth um, in the autumn as well um, this is really just bringing me to the end of my talk now um, which you'll, you'll be pleased to hear um, I just wanted to um, recommend a few other things that you might want to listen to if you if you have a little bit of time um, we have launched the um, some podcasts that were called the podcasting equine vets which was an initiative um, thought about by by Liz here and we've produced a number of different podcasts and there is um, th there's a lot of different podcasts out there that you can listen to so strangles lameness um, anesthesia and such but we have got one specifically on laminitis, one on equine metabolic syndrome and one on PPID that myself and Liz have recorded that you can find um, online. You'll find links to them through our, our Lock Leaven Equine Practice web page um, or through the Facebook page as well. So if you have got more time, then by all means, please do listen to them. Look at this statistic down here. We audited our euthanasia cases um, for 2019 and found out that more than one fifth of the horses that we euthanized last year had laminitis. And that is a terrifying statistic um, of, of all the horses that we put to sleep, some with old age and, and other ailments. One fifth, just over one fifth of them had laminitis. So please remember this statistic. I, I am trying to terrify you into reacting and sorting out the issues that your horses may have before they get laminitis because we don't want your horses to be included in the statistic here. Um, I also wanted to let you know at this difficult time um, that we have got a lot of protocols in place to still be able to provide you with a veterinary service. We do appreciate that it's, it's very difficult at the moment um, in light of the present circumstances, but we have always got at least two, if not three vets operating at any one time. Hugh is operating um, 24 hours a day to provide um, a, a full veterinary service and surgery if it is at all required with other ambulatory vets that we're all very experienced to help look after you. We may not be able to do absolutely every single test at the moment, but we, will, we are absolutely here to provide you with an emergency service if your horse has got laminitis and we will come to you that day if you think that is the case. Um, that's really, really important to stress. We don't want you not to phone us because you think oh, you know we're under lockdown and such. Um, we are completely operational for laminitis and we'll provide you with a full service as needed to get your horse, um, your horse back on track. So that comes to the end of the talk now. Thank you very much if you're still, still managing to pay attention. Um, that's okay, just, just shy of an hour. Um, thank you very much indeed for all your donations. Um, I believe we've raised in excess um, of £250 for our, our two local RDA groups. Um, Shars Mill and, and Scooney Hill, which um, come the end of the year, we will split up the proceeds um, equally between them and they will be, um, you know, I, I suspect very grateful recipients of the money that you donated tonight. Um, I want to thank Liz as well because Liz has put a lot of work into trying to get this, this operational and actually I think that's been from, from my point of view, a big success. This has been great. I mean, I'm, I'm sat in an empty room here speaking to myself. It does feel quite peculiar, but it seems to have worked um, very well. And what I'll do now is, is open up some questions, which I think Liz has probably got some questions which we'll run through first. And then we've also had some questions on Instagram, which we'll, we'll try and answer if I haven't already. Yes, we've got quite a few, Jenny. So um, if you can okay. bear with me, I will some of them are to answer. So, we covered uh, we covered the digital pulses and native ponies. Um, so um, Rosalind has asked, what is the best management for a pony who has previously had laminitis at this time of year? Presumably, mm -hmm. well, we we'll, we know the grass is is piling through at the moment with the with the weather that we've had. So okay, yeah. so I'm going to make an assumption that your pony does not have PPID or EMS. If you think that 
that your pony does and is suffering from either of those two conditions, I would encourage you to get in touch with us because we need to know about that with the diagnostic testing and then consider treating these conditions and giving you advice as per what we've spoken about tonight, specifically for your, your pony. Um, what you need to think about is, is restricting the grazing. You need to absolutely keep that pony's weight down. And if you can always try and aim to see that pony's ribs, that would be my, my best advice, is to absolutely keep that weight down. Assuming that the pony is still, still rideable, bearing in mind the previous bouts of laminitis, um, maybe it's a kid's pony or so, I would actively encourage exercise, and I would encourage exercise almost every day if you possibly can um possibly lunging even if it is just walking your pony like you're walking a dog any form of exercise will help if you go out jogging maybe you could take your pony with you as well it's certainly something i've considered um doing silly as that may sound but yeah um, weight management exercise um think about your pasture management minimizing the access to grass um starvation paddock strip grazing possibly even turn out into a sand school or or maybe if you've got an arena that would help as well so the ponies being turned out but not having direct access to grass um turn out at night and grazing muzzles i maybe didn't mention actually previously about grazing muzzles these are great ways to minimize um grass intake so there are multiple different ways where you can help lower the risk of that pony getting laminitis again um, and certainly at the time being with the, with the glorious weather we've had the sunshine and we've had bouts of rain now recently you need to be so careful because this grass is really going to start growing you know significantly at the present time absolutely i'm sat looking at my garden watching it grow <laughs> so I look at it. absolutely um, so alison has posted a comment which uh, I think is really worth just having a quick discussion about. Um, so she said, more of a comment than a question. I've got a mini Shetland who was diagnosed with PPID aged eight and has since also been diagnosed with EMS. However, he's never been overweight um, as we very much restrict access to grass, especially Great. in the spring, summer and autumn. Thankfully, he hasn't had laminitis for quite a few years. Um, I do think people need to be aware it's not just overweight horses that can get it. He is on treatment. He's on Prasen to control his cushing. Well done, Alison. And, and it, it, it absolutely is a great comment. We, we always stress that obesity is a clinical sign relating to EMS, but you can also find a lot, specifically our native horses and ponies, that will have EMS their whole life. And that's because they are gen genetically predisposed to having EMS. It is, it is a genetic problem that they have. Um, they are genetically bred to try and take all the goodness out of the grazing that we give them because you know Shetlands, Highlands, Cobbs, they really in nature if they were to be in a sense wild horses they're meant to be living on the side of mountains having very very poor forage, um, surviving winter out, no rugs, no shelter and the, the body has adapted over years and years to take as much goodness out of the feed that we give them as as they possibly can and that's why they can actually have ems their whole life despite not being fat they're just genetically predisposed to it so you do need to bear that in mind particularly for for these natives um and yep so thinking you know shetland mini shetland absolutely your classic uh, ems candidates there so it, it's it's a really really good point that although we have classical clinical signs that can can lead us to the suggestion that your horse has got EMS, it doesn't actually mean that um, it doesn't have it if, it if it's a thin horse. Thin horses can sometimes be EMS. Good. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so Gail has asked, um, if you can feel a gentle pulse in all the feet most of the time, sort of how thumping a pulse is a thumping pulse? If you can feel the pulse on all four legs and your horse is perfectly sound and you haven't done any forms of excessive exercise or trotting on roads recently, that's just as you find your horse as it stands in a stable, I would suggest to you that's probably completely clinically normal for your horse. It's very difficult to suggest what is a thumping per pulse versus a, a normal pulse. Um, a normal horse, you, you can absolutely feel the pulses. Um, you should only just be able to feel them. If you then put a little bit more pressure over the artery, you should be able to occlude the artery and stop that pulse. If they've got an absolutely thumping pulse, it takes a lot of pressure of your fingers over the artery to occlude it to stop that pulse there. So it's really difficult to answer it specifically, um, or I should say objectively um, as an actual fact. Um, 
but mild mild pulse is palpable as long as your horse is sound and comfortable and not showing any signs of problems i would suggest is completely normal but as the pulse gets stronger and stronger you, you should not have a thumping pulse on all all four feet super thank you Jen. um karen asked a question about um would you recommend hoof boots with pads in them instead of shoes Possibly, um, not terribly commonly. Um, if there was any reason that we felt nailing shoes onto your horse's foot may be detrimental, or if your horse had poor quality feet where your horse couldn't have shoes nailed on, would probably actually recommend gluing on shoes. There are, are some certain shoes, one of the brands we would think about would be an imprint shoe that is actually glued on to, to prevent the, the possible trauma of nailing shoes on. So, it's a really good question it's it's not something we recommend terribly often um if you had a horse that was barefoot and really didn't want shoes on it and we didn't feel that, it, that that not having the shoes would be detrimental then it may be something we would suggest but it's not it's not common that we would suggest hoof boots um for laminatics but it, it's a possibility and um, uh, somebody else has also asked um there seems to be a knee-jerk reaction to blame the farrier in cases where the laminatic horse isn't overweight how often is shoeing to blame? Not terribly often as a direct fault of the farrier. Um, you commonly can find a situation where the horse is shod, completely normal shoeing by a normal farrier doing a very, very good normal job on your horse's foot and a day or so later it's crippled with laminitis. Now, I am always very, very careful to stress to owners this is not indicating that the farrier has done anything wrong at all. We're, we're assuming that all the nails are in the right place and there's no other complications here. That's not your farrier's fault. What the situation was is that your, your horse was teetering on the edge of laminitis. It was just on that, that borderline of not laminitic to, to getting laminitis. And the trauma of the farriery has pushed it over the, over the edge to show the clinical signs there. So the farriery was the final straw that then showed up the clinical signs there. But not it's not a blame game to blame the farrier it's 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 almost i could almost say it's 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 pretty much never the farrier's fault that the horse gets laminitis it's just that the work that they do tips it over the edge but it wouldn't if, if your horse was completely normal your your farrier is never going to give them laminitis they, they potentially sometimes could give them a sore foot but i don't want to go into to situations like that but a farrier is never going to directly cause laminitis never ever and it's actually not something that we commonly hear people saying either. So it's it's an interesting point that someone's raised. I'm, I'm interesting to hear that because I yeah it, it it's it's not it, it's not common at all that, because in my mind a farrier will never cause laminitis in a normal foot. They will only show the clinical signs with the job they've done in a foot that was 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 suffering already, but possibly with subclinical signs. Great, thank you, Jenny. Um, now somebody else has also asked about oil for feeding so what oil do you recommend for energy for an e horse with ems um if you are needing to add energy into the system i would go with um bog standard sunflower oil um, any form of natural oil you can choose corn oil sunflower oil linseed oil um any oil can be used um i must admit if you're looking for a, an energy supply i would probably pick sunflower oil or corn oil would be my preference um there's no need to do any you know use any of the more expensive fancy ones they don't have any uh, any more sort of benefit or so um i don't recommend cod liver oil terribly often i like to try and keep to to natural ones that in a sense would be almost in the horse's diet um, naturally rather than a fish product even though i know cod liver oil is is certainly used with horses um so i i would recommend corn oil or sunflower oil Great, thank you. Um, Sophie has asked about, and I, I did reply and, and sort of, I may have just replied for you, Jenny, but um, she's just asked about any advice for soaking haylage when hay is not available. And my understanding of the situation was that we wouldn't normally recommend soaking hay. Yeah. You, you wouldn't normally recommend soaking haylage if, um, if your horse needed an incredibly strict diet and you had zero access to hay and you had to use haylage, we may recommend soaking it. You can soak it in exactly the same way as you can hay. So you would soak it for three hours if we're recommending it at all, which, which we tend probably not to. But haylage will 
it will become fetid very, very quickly after you dry it. So if a horse doesn't eat soaked hay, you probably have 12 to 24 hours before you would need to remove it from the stable and feed them fresh stuff, whereas haylage goes off very, very quickly after being soaked. So it's not something we tend to recommend. Um, if you were in that situation when we really did want your horse eating hay and, and all you had was haylage, um, there may be other alternatives to feeding as well. There, there are other products um, just thinking off the top of my head again with no affiliation to this company but Hallie's um, a local company to us do have different feed blocks and such um, small blocks that can be hydrated added water to them so that they expand um, which can be so grass blocks mixed with things like straw chop and such which can help as well so I think if we were in that situation where we were considering that haylage is, is not the right feed stuff you could not get any hay we'd probably be wrecking other, recommending other alternatives rather than soaking haylage Brilliant, super. Um, and then Hilary has asked, would it be ill-advised to buy my favourite riding school horse who is known to suffer from laminitis? <laughs> oh, um, it depends on how prepared you are to help prevent further laminitis and manage it if and when it likely happens. Um, we probably wouldn't strongly advise that you do purchase it because we as your vets try and prevent you from buying problems and a chronic laminitic is a known problem it's probably got changes in the position of the pedal bone in the foot already if it's had multiple bouts of laminitis which means it will be strongly predisposed to getting laminitis again even if you manage the weight very very carefully and make sure it doesn't have any underlying um, health conditions that the, the PPID EMS um, I, I wouldn't say no it may be that you could give that horse a, an incredibly good life quality of life and, and manage it incredibly well but it's it's a risk that you have to be prepared to take if you were to go forward and buy that horse it's a, it's a difficult one it's a sort of head head in the heart they might say different things Excuse me. Uh, I've also asked about is it venograms for horses um, suspected yep. uh, or having laminitis? How reliable are they, and how much is you know the right technique? How important is that, and how does that affect the results? <laughs> It's not a technique that we tend to use. Um, venograms are used to assess the circulation in the foot. We know that all laminitics have got compromised circulation in the feet. It, it potentially is something that maybe other hospitals are doing, but us as a clinic, it's not something that we tend to do. So I cannot comment specifically on sort of technique and reliability because it's simply not a technique that we tend to use. We simply go with the fact that we know that the circulation is compromised and we use the, the sort of management changes, the foot supports and the medications to try and help restore circulation as best possible rather than using a diagnostic technique to confirm really what we already know. Um, so I'm afraid I wouldn't want to comment on that any further because it's simply not a technique that we use um, at Loch Leven Equine Practice. Okay, great. Thank you, Jenny. Um, now, Jill, this is, um, so I think that's all the questions on our on our Q&A panel, um, but we've had a couple of emails come in as well. Jill has asked about um, frosty grass and the practice of keeping horses in until the frost has melted on grass. Is that still the current thinking? It, 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 you tend to find that frosty grass has got a higher sugar content. I cannot comment on the scientific reason behind that because I simply don't know why that happens. But I think if you have got a horse that is, is suffering from laminitis or has got EMS, then it would be sensible to, to not turn the horse directly out. If you've got a completely normal clinical horse, it would not concern me turning a horse out onto frosty grass. Okay, super. Now, Melissa has sent in an email. Um, I'll just there's quite a lot of information in it um so i will just pick three she's got three native ponies one of which has had a fairly bad laminitic episode um in 2016 but she's managed them to manage that successfully since um her real concern comes um with the grass essentially and managing her grass and um, her question is that they've recently sprayed the paddock for weeds, so it's been out of bounds for two weeks, during which we've had a fair bit of rain. How do I safely introduce the ponies to the fresh grass, if at all? Um, it's still only a maximum of three to four inches high. 
my hay bill yeah, is high, <laughs> so it would be good to use the grass if I can, mm-hmm. if it keeps my husband happier for a start, which is always a good thing. Um, she's been feeding them a small hay net before turning them out for a few hours on the fresh grass in the evening, but she feels quite nervous about it and feels that she's taking a risk. And um, yep. So really, it's a yeah. It's how do we manage the the amount of grass that we're seeing? It's at the it's it's actually a very very difficult situation to reintroduce your ponies to that grass. Um, three to four inches is a significant amount of grass um, for these wee ponies. Um, if you could get hold of any sheep, that would be really helpful. Or if there were any um, healthy ponies and horses without laminitis that potentially could be put in to graze that grass down. You know, any thoroughbreds. If you're on a shared yard, anything like that, that would be. Um, a sensible idea what you cannot do is you cannot just go in and mow the lawn and then turn your ponies out onto it because you will find that the sugar in the grass will be concentrated in what's left um, so even though they're eating short grass it's still very very high in um in sugars and carbohydrate concentration there um, if you had sheep in to graze it um, the act of grazing over time reduces the sugar in in what's left in the grass that would be a good option um, if you haven't got any of those options then what i would suggest is using a very very small area taped off turning the horses out in it at night and letting them graze it down um, possibly also adding some hay in at that point in time until they've got an area that's really really bare and then you can start strip grazing so you can very very gradually just push your fence back but when I say gradually I mean honestly like half a foot a day um, a very very small area and so you can gradually open that area up but um, if you can try any any way of reducing the overall quantity of grass they're having and, and sheep certainly would be actually a very good option in that case you may be in a situation where much as I appreciate you want to keep your husband happy which is yep very very important it may be that you have to think about keeping those ponies on a very very small area and using hay to supplement their their fiber rather than allowing them more access to grass because you simply cannot afford to give them them plenty of access to, to longer grass it's it's too much of a risk that you you cannot afford to take um so you have to think about it in that sense but uh, there's certainly a few options there um grazing muzzle um put grazing muzzles on all of them some people deem them cruel i'm not one of those people i think they can actually save lives rather than thinking about them being cruel they slow down how much how much grass the horse can actually take in and and minimize how much they can take in at any one time they make them work much harder for the grass that they're getting so it provides entertainment as well and it allows them to be turned out for longer so that would be an option as well but um certainly not not turn them out in the grass on these uh, glorious sunny days we're having use uh, use the night time to help you as well great thanks jenny um and then i've had another question come through on email um from jane who was asking about sort of balancing up quality of life in our older horses versus the risk of laminitis which i think is you know that's probably quite relevant for lots of us it's that balance isn't it between making yeah. sure they have a quality of life but you know yeah absolutely and with regards to laminitis it's such a huge welfare issue that the welfare can actually impact on quality of life um i am not an advocate of keeping a horse locked up in a stable for its entire life with zero access to freedom just because we can keep it alive and that's the only way to keep it comfortable that's not my idea of a quality of life so if we're looking at a horse having to to stay in off pasture entirely or or at least never get out of a stable then i would deem that an inappropriate quality of life and i would be recommending euthanasia at that stage um, you have to weigh up how much we put horses through, how much they suffer to then hopefully recover versus the idea that they're suffering too much and that their quality of life is is adversely affected enough that euthanasia is actually a better option for them. It's difficult and that would be very much um, an individual, a case-by-case situation where you would have to consider that. But, but quality of life and welfare is absolutely up there at the top of the list with what we have to consider when we're treating laminitics. Because if you've taken the quality of life away, or indeed the laminitis has taken the quality of life away, and we cannot resolve that, then that is a direct cause for a reason for euthanasia. So it's very, very important to consider. Okay, super. Um, do you have, I know there were a few questions from Instagram, Jenny. Did yeah, we- we're, we're not far off. We're, we're nearly... Um, we're nearly there. These are just the last few questions that we had on, on Instagram, which are great. And um, my old horse was tested negative for PPID a few years ago. Is it worth testing again, even though it's not currently laminitic? Um, but it is showing alterations of uh, delayed hair coat shedding. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, Cushing's disease is a disease that you don't have it, you don't have it. 
one day you'll be diagnosed, the horse will be diagnosed positive with it. And that means your horse is going to be positive for PPID for the rest of its life. What we can do with PPID is that we can treat it, but we can't cure it. And that what that means is that we can very effectively use medication to manage it, but we can't cure it and get rid of it so that we can stop taking the medication and have it not be there. It's always going to be there. But just because your horse was negative a few years back doesn't mean it doesn't have it now. There has to be at some point where the, the alterations with the negative feedback in the brain and the increase in, in size of the pituitary gland happen, at which point the horse would be positive for Cushing. So yes, if you've got concerns that your horse has got PID, absolutely, it is completely worth testing again. Um, next question, the benefit of doing a glucose challenge or the caro syrup um, test if you suspect uh, PPID. So it would depend on what clinical signs your horse is showing, whether we do tests for EMS or PPID or both. If you've got an animal that is actively suffering from laminitis, we would recommend doing both the, the, the caro syrup test or the glucose challenge test together with the tests for PPID, so measuring ACTH levels. So yes, there is a benefit, but it would depend on, on the individual situation that the horse is in. Um, horses could have one condition or they could have both conditions. Um, and we need to distinguish what, which condition the horse has so that we can treat them accordingly. So that's, that's why there is benefit to doing both tests if your vet thinks it's, it's sensible to do so. Um, another question, is EMS reversible? In some horses, absolutely. In a lot of the natives, you will not reverse it no matter how thin you get these ponies because they are just genetically susceptible to that condition. In our our bigger non-native horses and ponies, it generally does tend to be reversible so that if you can get the weight down, you will reverse the fact that that horse has got EMS. So no, it is it does not have it forever. Um, although it's important to remember, as per the comment previously, that some, some horses can. Um, last question. my cob has mild laminitis again she's on the box rest butte plans to do our radiographs last summer she tested negative for ems should we test again now yes absolutely um last year was last year this is entirely different now the pony or horses or the cob's weight could have changed yes it's important to do it again um because things do change similar to the ppid um at one point you don't have ems you can put on weight and then you can have it um and I'm assuming last yeah, it was negative last year. Um, so thankfully, we've not got the, the genetic predisposition of having it the whole time. But you could absolutely have a horse that's got EMS now. So please get in touch with your veterinary surgeons, us or, or, or whoever you use. And, and you should arrange to have, um, have further tests undertaken. Perfect. Now, we literally have two more questions that have come in on the panel, Jenny, which I don't think we okay. want to answer. So... Um, Beth has asked, any advice on keeping weight off the neck, as this seems to be the only part that seems to collect and store the fat? No specific advice to get weight off a crest, other than the standard weight management that we've gone through. You will find some horses are naturally cresty. Again, generally, our natives are, are particularly prone to this. Just something to look out for, though. If your horse has got a cresty neck that is absolutely solid, rock hard, that is a huge concern. That is a, a very, very strong predisposing factor to the fact that that horse has got EMS and will be at a very high risk of laminitis. Even if your pony or horse has got a cresty neck, if it's soft and you can, you can feel it and you can sort of squash your fingers into that fat pad there, it's not so much of a concern. So if your horse is cresty with a soft crest and is relatively lean, I wouldn't be worrying about that too much. If that crest is rock hard, you need to be concerned and you need to be speaking to your veterinary surgeon to think about undertaking tests and speaking to your vet about what you can do about that um, to manage it. But I do appreciate that it can be very, very difficult and some horses will naturally be cresty. Even if they are incredibly lean, you may find you don't get rid of that crest. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't get too fixated on it entirely, but if it is, if it's rock hard, then, then I would be concerned about the crest. But as long as it's soft and as long as the horse is lean, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Great, thank you, Jenny. And then the, the final question we've got is somebody has asked about barefoot track systems for laminitis. Mm -hmm. um, track systems are, are another way of uh, maintaining your grazing. The idea is, is that you, you work on tracks around, generally around the periphery of the field so that the horse has to walk a longer distance to get its feed. Um, it, it's simply another way of paddock management, absolutely can be used. Um, 
it's it's very very common in America that they use um, track system grazing, but I've seen a few clients um, with it here actually, and it's it's been really interesting to see actually because we don't do it quite so much. But yes, absolutely another way of managing um, managing grazing. So you're sort of minimising the overall area and access to grass, but you're making them walk for it at the same time. So it's another another method that can be used to minimise uh, space at grazing. And obviously, um, not when there's an acute. Um, Oh, absolutely not. Not when you're you're actively dealing with laminitis. No, that that's your you know going back to your box rest. But you know, when your your horses are turned out, it's certainly a method that you can think about using if you if you've got the room in your fields to do that. It take, it takes a lot of management. It takes a lot of fencing as well, which I think is what puts a lot of people off. But it is an option that can be utilised. Um, certainly. Brilliant. Well, I think that's. I think we've managed to remember all of the questions. So. Um, Jenny, first of all, thank you very much for your time. We, I very much appreciate it. Um, and as I know you've already said thanks to everybody for their donations, but we are incredibly grateful for the donations that we've got to the RDA, and I know they will, will be as well. Um, if you guys would like us to do more of these, then please let us know. You can send us an email, you can contact us on Facebook. We'd love to know about topics as well. So if there's other topics that you'd like us to cover, um, we can obviously do all of the normal ones, um, colic and ulcers and all of those sorts of things. But um, yeah, we would um, be very keen to do more now we've worked the technology side of it out. Yeah, no, it, it seems to, from my point of view, I think this has been been very successful. And, and yes, if you if you do have any any comments or feedback on, on how you found it, please let us know. I mean, we've been about an hour and a half. I don't know how you feel about the, the time scales as well. And is it better to have shorter sessions or so? Please do let us know. It's been a big learning curve for us um and liz really has put a lot of time in into making this happen um and i certainly think that the two of us feel it's, it's been a big success so any any comments you do have please get in touch email facebook um and, and let us know and we'll we'll try and and, and help out and, and do things as best we can to, to 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 do what you want brilliant thanks very much guys have a good evening super thank you then take care bye bye You good? You good? I'm just like, I'll just send it.